or this morning, say amen. 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 Glad to be in God's house. Can I rearrange a little bit? I hope it's okay. Okay. I'm one of those that likes to move everything and stuff. What I'm really trying to do is make sure I don't break nothing while I'm here, all right? Uh, but I appreciate the opportunity to be in God's house with you. Uh, we are, my name is Matthew Frank, my wife Hannah, my son Titus, daughter Savannah. Uh, we're missionaries out of Granite State Baptist Church there in Concord, New Hampshire. Uh, been there for eight months now, something like that. And uh, we've been up since September the 1st. I'll let you do the math on, on it, all right? Uh, but we've been up, moved up September the 1st. was our first full day here. And uh, I told my wife, I said, it was, it was weird walking in here this morning and people knowing who I was. Uh, <laughs> I'm used to walking in places and them saying, who are you and what are you doing here, <laughs> all right? Uh, but I appreciate the support, appreciate your prayers, uh, appreciate everything that y'all do for us. Thank you so much for the nice motel room last night. It was, we have been working 12 hours a day this week at least, uh, trying to get the office there done. Uh, I'm renting a storage unit right now with Bibles and material and everything else in it. And I'm trying to keep from paying another month. So we've been working like crazy trying to get everything done. I'm going to move that in because I'll kick that over. Um, but we've been working like crazy this week trying to get everything done. So if you see paint, I've got paint on my knuckles. I've got paint on my arms. <laughs> All right. And I have taken at least two baths since then, okay? But it just will not come off, okay? Um, I promise you I've taken at least two, sometimes two a day, Okay. <laughs> Uh, but I appreciate the opportunity to be able to serve God here in New England. It's, an it's a privilege and opportunity to live here and to be able to serve Him here. We're thankful for the call of God on our life. Now this afternoon, uh, Lord willing, I'll take a little bit more time and tell you a little bit more about what's going on. But I want to go ahead and get into the Word of God this morning. I want you to take your Bibles and go with me to the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter number 4. When the preacher told me he was going through... The book of Ephesians, I, I'll be honest, I'm like, man, I wish you hadn't told me that, because <laughs> uh, the messages that the Lord's laid on my heart for today, uh, both of them are actually out of the book of Ephesians, so, uh, but by the time you get to Ephesians chapter 4, he'll have something else coming up, and all I'm doing is making his job harder, because now he's going to have to study that much harder <laughs> to be able to say something, all right? <laughs> Six, oh, six months, y'all won't even remember this, all right? Uh, I promise you, like I said this morning, it won't be that memorable, all right? Ephesians chapter number 4, look with me at verse number 17. We've already read it, but I want to take just a moment and read, read this to you. If you find your place and you're willing and able, let's stand reverence to the reading of the Word of God. Ephesians chapter 4, look with me at verse number 17. The Bible says, This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth... Walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. Now, can I stop and say this? We are Gentiles this morning. As far as I know, there's not a Jew present this morning. If you are, you're the exception to my statement. But it doesn't change the fact that Gentiles, as Gentiles, we do what we know we're, we do what our heart tells us to do, if I can say it that way. And the Bible says that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. You want to know why sinners act the way they act? Because they're wicked. They're sinners. That's why they act the way they act. I don't get frustrated with sinners. I get frustrated with people that say they're saved, that say that they're mature Christians, and then they still live like the world, still act like the world. That's the ones I get frustrated with. But Paul says in verse number 17, he says, that you walk not, that you henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk, in the vanity of their mind, having, their, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to, unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. But ye have not so learned Christ, if so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, 
which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbors, for we are members one of another. Who would have thought that Paul would have to tell these people here at the church at Ephesus not to lie about people? Who would have thought that? But here's the thing, that's the day and hour we're living in, because nowadays the church wants to act more like the world, and the world just keeps going further and further and further and further, and now we're trying to move the line. Here's the thing. Can I just go ahead and get on, go on record and say this? It's not time to move the line. If we're moving it any direction, we ought to be moving it closer to God instead of further away from God. It's not time to back up. It's not time to quit. It's not time to throw in the towel. But more now more than ever, we ought to be doing exactly what Paul said where he said, stand fast. Here's the thing. We're supposed to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. It's not time to give in. It's not time to quit. It's not time to throw in the towel. But rather, it's time to move forward for the honor and the glory of God. Let me, I can't get sidetracked this morning, all right? Verse number, verse number 26, Be angry and sin not, and let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands, the thing which is good that he may have to give to him that need it. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of the edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Can I just stop and ask this question? And I'm not, I may preach this here in a minute, I may not. But does your speech minister grace? Does my speech minister grace? When I talk to somebody, is it always, well, this is going on and that's going on? And, you know, we're just having such a hard time with this and this is, you know, this is happening and that's happening. Or are we talking about the things of God and are we building them up rather than telling them? You ever been around them people that you're scared to ask them how they're doing? Because they'll be honest with you. <laughs> and they'll tell you every little minute detail. I've got to the point where I just say, Whenever people, I'll get around people, I don't even ask them how they're doing anymore. I just say, hey, ain't God been good to us today? Because even if, you, even if you're having a bad day, you'd ha still have to admit, God's been good to us. God's been better to us than what we deserve, and if we got what we deserve, we'd be in hell this morning. But God, who is rich in mercy for His great love, wherewith He loved us, amen? And let me go on. Verse number 30, the Bible says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you're sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Let's go, Lord, in word of prayer, and then you can be seated for the message from the word of God this morning. Our Heavenly Fathers, we come into your presence to pray. I want to thank you for this day. Thank you for your many blessings. Thank you for the privilege and opportunity you give me to stand and to preach your word this morning. Lord, I pray that you'd help me this morning. Lord, I pray that you give me the words to say, the words not to say. Lord, you put a watch care about my mouth. Help me not to do or say anything that will grieve or quench your Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray that you'd help me to do and say everything that you want said and done for your honor and your glory this morning. Lord, I pray that you'd help us not to leave here the same way that we came in, but Lord, you'd help us to leave here being challenged by the Word of God, changed by the Spirit of God. Lord, help us this morning, I pray. Lord, if there's one lost soul under the sound of my voice this morning or watching via live stream, whatever, Lord, I pray that you'd save them for time and for eternity. Bring that backslider back to you. And we'll thank you and we'll praise you for it's in your Son's holy, wonderful, precious name we pray. Amen and amen. You can be seated. Thank you so much for standing. Here in this passage of Scripture, we've read several verses here this morning, 15 verses this morning, and I, I want to focus in on from verse number 22 down through verse number 20 or verse number 32. But I want to give you just something just by way of introduction. In verse number 17 down through verse number 24, Paul begins to talk about a complete deliverance. He tells us about a new life in verse number 17. In ver through verse number 21 as he talks about our past life in verse number 17 and 18 he says in verse number 18 he said having the understanding darkened being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart he said look in your past life you lived in a dark time when before I got saved by the grace of God before I started walking in the light guess what I was living in darkness and so were you 
Paul recognizes that fact and he says, listen, he said, you were in darkness, but now you've been lightened. Now you walk in that light. And he goes on to talk about the darkness. But then he talks about we was depraved in verse number 19. Who being past feeling. You ever met somebody like that? They don't care about anybody else. They don't care about how you feel. They don't care about anything. All they care about is themselves. And truth be told, they don't even really care about themselves. Why? Because they're to pray. Paul tells us, he says, this is your past life. He's not talking to sinners in these verses. He's talking to saints. He's talking to those that are saved by the grace of God. He is literally writing a letter to a church there in Ephesus. He tells them that he talks about their past life. But then in verse number 20, he kind of changes gears and he says, hey, let's talk about your present life for just a second. Verse number 20, he said, but you have not so learned Christ. He said, hey, listen, you've changed. There's been a change take place. When the day that I got saved by the grace of God, guess what? There was a change took place in my life. He was talking this morning in Sunday school about Ephesians chapter 2. He said in verse number 19, for you're no more strangers and foreigners. Hey, I'm glad I've been made a fellow citizen. I'm not part of the world anymore, but I'm part of his country. I'm a citizen of the United States. But I'm a citizen of a heavenly country. One day after a while, I'm going home to be with my Lord and my Savior. One day after a while, I'm going home to be with Him. Hallelujah. Why? Because there was a change took place in my life. Go to verse number 21. Down in verse number 22 with me. He said in verse number 21, He said, "If If so be that you have heard Him and have been taught by Him as the truth, He is in Jesus And here's a challenge here that you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And that you put on the new man, which after God is in Christ, or which after God, excuse me, is created in righteousness and true holiness. Righteousness and true holiness mark the nature of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we deliberately put on the new nature, righteousness and holiness will be seen in our lives. People will begin to recognize us for who we are. The Sunday school teacher this morning, he made mention of what the guy said in the book that he was reading out of. He said, stop and examine your conversation. Can people tell you're a Christian? And that's exactly what Paul's getting to here in this passage of Scripture. He said, it's time to put off the old man and put on the new man. He said, Brother Matthew, what do you mean by that? Well, here's the thing. I believe this morning, and Brother Rob may believe a little bit differently than what I do. I don't know. We've not talked about it. But I believe that there, there that a person can be saved but not be a Christian. He said, Brother Matthew, what do you mean by that? They've been saved. They're no longer dying going to hell, but they're not a Christian. The word Christian means Christ-like. Little Christian. I know some people this morning that they say they're saved by the grace of God, and they very well may be, but they don't live like a Christian ought to live. So, Brother Matthew, how should a Christian live? By this book. We talked about it this morning in Sunday school about having a daily reading time, having a daily devotional time. If we're going to be mature Christians, if we're going to be those that the world can look at and see Christ in us, they're going, we're going to be Christ-like. We're going to have to be in this book. Paul tells us three thing, or two things just by way of introduction. He tells us, number one, what must be put off, what must be taken or put off. Verse number 22, he says the old disposition must be taken off. In verse number 22, he said that you put off concerning the former conversation. He said that's the way that you used to talk. When a person gets saved by the grace of God and they begin to allow God to change their life from the inside out, guess what? There's going to be a change in their disposition. They're not going to talk the same way. And I'll say it this way. I'll even go a step further than that. Preacher, I believe that when a person gets saved, there's a change there. But when a person really sells out, there's another change. Because here's the thing. You can get, you can have, forgive the terminology, but you can have your get out of hell free card. 
and not be a sold out separated Christian. And Paul begins to talk about this. He said there's going to be a change in the disposition, that conversation, that's that, that word conversation means that manner of life. They're going to talk different. They're going to walk different. See, a person that's saved by the grace of God, but they're not sold out, they might be able to go to some of them places. Do you know what he said over in the book of Hebrews? I believe it is. He said, let us lay aside every weight and the sin. See, that person that gets saved, you know what they've done? They've laid aside the sin. But the more that you sell out and the more that you let go and the more that you let God, guess what begins to happen? He says, hey, this is a weight for you. You need to let go of this. This isn't good for you. This will hold you back. You know that, run, that runner that runs that marathon, you know what he does? He trains with weights. But guess what he don't do the day of the race? He don't have the weights. Why? Because now he has trained his body. He has built up his endurance to where he can run that whole race. And he can run faster than what he could with those weights. We see the old disposition must be put off. Not only that, verse number 22, the last part there, he says, that is, or excuse me, put off the, that you put off concerning the former conversation of the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. Not only does he put off your old disposition, he also says put off your old desires. Can I be honest with you? Eight years ago, me and my wife, I think eight years ago, 2012, 2011, okay, 2012, me and my wife got married. The next summer, so it'd be eight years ago this year, the next summer we got a call, said, hey, if you want to, she got a call, said, hey, if you want to see your grandmother again alive, you need to get up here and get up here right now. So we drove all the way, we drove 24 hours straight to get up here to Maine, to West Sumner, Maine. And I remember coming up here and sitting, and we, we got up here, and ever, all the family started coming in. Well, then she started taking the turn for the better. She got better, and everybody left. But I remember, sitting in the, I remember sitting in the living room of one of my wife's aunts, and she looked at me, and she said, you need to come up here and do something. And I said, <laughs> no. I said, I will never move up here. You know why? It wasn't my desire. You know what my desire was? To stay where I was at. But you know what? The more that I started selling out, I was already saved. And the more that I started selling out and saying, God, you can have this and you can have this and you can have this, you know what began to happen? He began to change my desires. And eight months ago, nine months ago, however long it's been now, I moved my family 1,100 miles because God said, hey, this is where I want you. He changed my desires. That you put off the old man. He talks about putting off the old disposition, the old desire. But then in verse number 23, he talks about putting off the old direction. He said that, you, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. You know what that means? That means, hey, let's refresh that mind. Let's, let's talk about your mindset for a minute. You know, when it, before March of last year, preacher, there was a whole lot of people had a whole lot of different mindsets about a whole lot of different things. You know what this past 15 months has done? It has changed a whole lot of mindsets in a whole lot of people. Do you know what some people have done? It solidified their mindset. But here's the thing. Paul says, hey, I want you to put off that old man. I want you to change that direction. But then he talks about what, not only what must be put off, but he talks about what must be put on. Verse number 24, and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Notice he didn't say fake. He said true. See, there's a whole lot of fake stuff going around right now, ain't there? But there's not a whole lot of true holiness going around. You say, Brother Matthew, what do you believe true holiness is? Living according to this Bible. And not saying, well, I believe this verse and I believe this verse, but I don't believe that verse. People say, oh, just preach the Bible, just preach the Bible. Honestly, our flesh can't handle Bible preaching. Because you know what it does? It offends our flesh. Because a preacher get up there and he'll get to he'll get to preaching the Bible, 
You know what begins to happen? Stomping all over our toes. You know why? Because it's Bible preaching. What must be put off? What must be put on? Can I preach just for the next few moments on this simple thought? It's time to change clothes. You know, every day when we get up this week, I've, I've tried to wear kind of the same outfits because I didn't want to have paint on 20 different outfits. But I've tried to wear the same clothes. But you know what I did this morning? I didn't put on the same clothes I had on yesterday to come to church. You know why? Because they probably wouldn't have smelled the greatest. And I'm sure everybody's thankful for that. But here's the thing. Whenever you wear the same clothes day after day after day, you know what happens? I don't care if you take a bath every day or not. You can take a bath every single day and wear the same clothes every day for a week, and at the end of that week, those clothes will stink. Well, preacher, I took a bath every day. Okay, did you change clothes? Here's the thing. Whenever it comes to this Christian life, it's time to put off the old man. And it's time to put on the new man. Can I give you four things that Paul gives us here in this text? It's right here in the text that, we'll have, that we have before us. Verse number 25, he tells us, number one, it's time to change clothes. It's time to change our words. Verse number 25, he said, Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with our neighbor, or with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. This deals with our emotions. He tells us about a transformed tongue in verse number 25. He said, wherefore, putting away lying. Speak every man truth, wasn't it? You know what's amazing to me that he had to tell those people there at Ephesus not to lie? Do you know what? He'd have to tell every single Baptist church in America today not to lie. You know why? You said, Brother Matthew, what do you mean? Every single one of us at some point in our daily life, whether we mean to or whether we don't, what happens? We tell a lie. You know what this new man does? He puts away that. And whenever the new man lies, you know what begins to happen? He's convicted immediately. I said something the other day to somebody, and as soon as I said, the Holy Spirit said, that's a lie. And I, I looked at the person right in front of me. I said, you know what? I said, I shouldn't have said that. I said, that was a lie. I said, I'm sorry. He said, but Matthew, I wouldn't have said that. Here's the thing. I'm just being real with you. I am, what you see is what you get. I don't put on no airs. I don't try to act sometimes. But here's the thing. In our daily Christian life, we're supposed to put away lying. We're supposed to speak truth. And you know that comes to business dealings? Now here's the thing. I don't like paying full price for anything. Anything. And right now I'm, I've got a 6x12 uh, trailer, utility trailer. It's got ramps on the back and ramp on the side. I'm like, okay, you know. But I really want an enclosed trailer. Don't ask me why I want an enclosed. I mean, I know why I want an enclosed trailer, but that don't, doesn't matter to the store. But you know what? I went and looked at this trailer the other day. And he wanted fifteen hundred dollars for a six by twelve trailer, enclosed trailer. Like, oh, that's not a bad price. I get there, and the rims are about rusted out. The lights don't work. It's got holes in the sides of it. And I'm thinking, man, I'm gonna have to do a lot of work to this trailer. Fifteen hundred dollars is a good deal, but if you got to turn around and put another thousand dollars into it, it's not that great of a deal, is it? I begin thinking, I'm like, okay, how am I gonna do this? You know what I did? I said, well, and I started naming off stuff. Y'all don't look so spiritual, okay? But I started naming off stuff. Well, I have to do this to it, and I have to do that to it, and I have to do that. And he's like, yeah, every bit of that I, put, I stated in the post. And I said, well, is your bottom dollar $1,500? And you know what the Holy Spirit said? What are you doing? Because here's the thing. You know what I was doing? Y'all forgive me for this. But I made out like those tires, those rusted rims, like they might have been a little worse than what they was. You said, Brother Matthew, you're a horrible person. Don't, don't judge me too bad, okay? When you're trying to get something for nothing, right? See, y'all laughing because y'all know this. Y'all have done the same thing probably. 
I hate paying full price for anything. And if I can talk somebody down a couple hundred, we we had a 2003 Pontiac Grand Prix, brother. <laughs> We prayed for two years out of that vehicle. Lord, please let us get two years out of this vehicle. Y'all ever bought a vehicle like that? I mean, it came from Michigan, and I took it to have a full wheel, I took it to have an alignment done on it, and he said, if I turn that bolt, that whole frame may fall apart. Okay, please don't turn the bolt. <laughs> I got up underneath, got to looking at everything, and I said, he wanted $1,900 for it. And I said, I tell you what, I'll give you $1,400 right now. He said, done. Do you know what? We don't like paying full price for nothing, do we? Do you know what the Bible says? Speak every man through the... Well, you know what we try to do? We try to make it out to where it's worse than what it really is. You ever notice that you get around people and their story's always worse than what yours is? They've always got it worse than what you do. I mean, I could stand up here and tell you some stories. <laughs> Joint, it wouldn't do me no good. You know why? Because all I'm doing is trying to exact, all I'd be doing is trying to make my story worse than what your story is. You know what the new man does? You know what that spiritual Christian does? He doesn't tell everybody else. You know what he does? He tells him. Because here's the thing, at the end of the day, he's the only one that can help anyway. He says, wherefore putting away lying, speak every man truth that was there. Go to verse number 26 with me. He not only talks about a transformed tongue, he talks about a transformed temper. Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Anger kindled by the old man is always sinful, destructive, and devilish. Anger kindled by the Holy Spirit at the sight of some injustice, some great depravity, or some monstrous iniquity is intended to give those who are engaging in the sinful activity Reason to fear. Paul is simply saying this. Be angry, be angry, but don't miss the mark. Control your anger. When I got saved, my mom, you can call her this morning and ask her, my mom wouldn't even let me have a knife because I had such an anger problem. Nowadays, I carry a knife and at least one gun. <laughs> so what the Lord's had to do? He's had to work on me from that. Because now, now I'm like, is that really worth getting mad over? Now, if it's worth getting mad over, son, we're gonna, I mean, we're going we're gonna to get real mad in a hurry. But at the end of the day, is that a hill worth dying on? Be angry and sin not. So oftentimes, we as Christians, we get mad about the least little things, do we not? And we, we throw up our defenses and... The Facebook has brought that out in a lot of people. Facebook had never made the deaf to see and the dumb to hear, but it sure has made the dumb to speak. <laughs> Y'all don't fall out with me on that. Okay. But here's the thing. All throughout our lives, we're surrounded with different opinions about things, are we not? I mean, we could talk about the vaccine. We could talk about the mask. We could talk about... So we could talk about all kinds... And I guarantee you, if I go to every single person in here, there's going to be people that are going to be on this side of it. There's going to be people that are going to be on that side of it. And then there's going to be people that just don't care. I'm in that, second, that third category, okay? But here's the thing. At the end of the day, is it a hill worth dying on? Brother Rob said it this morning. I asked him, I said, do I have to wear this while I was preaching? And he said, yes. You know what I did? I put it on. You know why? It's not a hill we're dying on. We get so caught up in our, in our flesh that we forget what this world or what we're supposed to be doing in this world. He said, be angry and sin not. Talks about a transformed temper. Not only that, it's time to change your words, but go to verse number 27. The Bible says, neither give place to the devil. He not only talks about changing our words, but he also talks about changing your whereabouts. This deals with the executive in our lives. So, Brother Matthew, what difference does it make if I give place to the devil? Because the more you give place to him, the less you're living for God. It's just like you take two dogs and the one you feed the most, that's who's going to get strong. 
The one you don't feed, they're going to get weak and they're eventually going to die. Whichever one you feed, whether it's the flesh or whether it's the Holy Spirit, whichever one that you develop that relationship more with, guess, what's going, guess who's going to be stronger? If you constantly live for the devil, he's going to have preeminence in your life. If you constantly live for the Lord, he's going to have preeminence in your life. But have you noticed a downward progression Verse number 25, he says, Wherefore, putting away lying, be angry and sin not. And then he says, Neither give place to the devil. You know why verse number 26 and verse number 25 happens? Because we do what verse number 27 says. We give place to the devil. So often times in my Christian life, and again, I told you, what you see is what you get. But so often times in our Christian life, you know what we do? We act like this is all there is. And because of that, we focus on this instead of focusing on Him. If 2020 didn't do anything for anybody, you know what it did do? It made people stop and reevaluate their priorities. We was in a, I was in a church in Pennsylvania three, two, three weeks ago, something like that. Three weeks ago now, I think it was, last Sunday, April, whenever that was. But you know what? They had a goal for Faith Promise Preacher. They had a goal for $95,000. I was like, praise God. They took up mission cards on Sunday morning, $120,000. They took up mission cards again on Sunday night from people that had over $130,000. You know why? This is a little Frankology. Not necessarily to be confused with Richardology. Okay? You know why I think that is? Because people realize, you know what? I don't have to go out to eat every day. I don't have to do this. I don't have to do that. But what I do have to do is I have to focus on getting the gospel to a lost and dying world. If 2020 in the first five months of 2021 hasn't revealed anything, it has revealed how bad of a spiritual condition our country is in. And people are starting to focus on that. Neither give place to the devil. It's time to change your words. It's time to change your whereabouts. But not only that, look at verse number 28. The Bible says, Let him that stole steal no more. Rather, let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good that he may, give, he may have to give to him that needeth. Not only change our whereabouts, change our words, but it's time to change our work. This deals with the energy that we're putting out. You notice in verse number 28, the first part, he said, let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his own hands, or wor working with his hands, the thing which is good. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse number 11, he said that you study to be quiet and work with your own hands and do your own business. I think it was Savannah, I think it was Savannah said it this morning in the motel. Titus, and I'm, I try not to tell things about my kids, but we're in that stage where he wants to know everything about everything. And it's to the point where I just look at him, is that your business? I don't even answer his question. Is that your business? Well, no. And Savannah looked at him this morning. She said, if you mind your own business, you won't be minding mine. And I'm like, I couldn't have said it better myself. So you know what? That's exactly what he tells us to do. You know, if you're working, I noticed this past week the times that I would sit down, that's whenever I had time to look around and see what everybody else was doing. But the times that I was working, I mean, you can't hardly see. I mean, whenever you're down on your knees putting caulk around a baseboard, I mean, you can't really see anything else. You don't want to see anything else. You're just trying to focus on what you're doing so that you can get up. When you're rolling a, when you're rolling a roller on a wall putting paint on, hey, when y'all was up here doing this, did y'all do this or did y'all have somebody do it? So I promise you, whenever somebody's over here painting this wall, they wasn't looking around. Well, I wonder what everybody else is doing. I promise you they wasn't. Because if they had of, 
it ended up all over him. Do you know what? He said, let him work. Or working, rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good that he may have to give to him that needeth. Change our work. It deals with our energy. Can I ask you a question this morning? How much energy do you put into watching what everybody else is doing? Me and my wife was having a conversation yesterday. She said, well, I didn't know this. We was talking about a particular situation. She said, I didn't know that. I said, I don't care. She said, Brother Matthew, what do you mean? I don't care what somebody else does. I want to see you grow spiritually. I want to see you go on for God. But here's the thing. At the end of the day, you know who i got to answer for the judgment seat of Christ? Me. I have to answer for what I did. I have to answer for how I lived. I have to answer for how my family lives. I don't have to answer for you. If you want to do things that are contrary to the Word of God, by all means. But you've got to give an answer to God for that. And we've got to a point in our churches all across this country, and trust me, we're in a lot of them. We're in, we've got to the point in our churches all across the country, it's not about, hey, let's keep our eyes focused on Him. It's, let's see what everybody else is doing. Y'all know we're independent, right? Last time I checked, there's an independent Baptist church, right? That means you don't answer to anybody else. Y'all answer to God. The church down the road, they answer to God. They don't answer to you. Unless God, they ought not be doing that. Who cares? I'm, y'all forgive me. It frustrates me because we're to the point where we've got so focused on, well, this and over here is doing this and this and over here is doing that. We don't, that ain't right. Okay, let them answer to God for it. You know who pastors Fellowship Baptist Church? It's not you, it's not you, it's not you, it's not anybody else out here. It's that man right there. And you know who has to give an answer to God for Fellowship Baptist Church? That man right there. You know who makes decisions that impacts everybody else in here? That man right there. You know who I believe takes it before the throne of God and asks God, God, what would you have me do? God, what do you want us to do in this situation before he ever makes a decision? That man right there. He said, Brother Matthew, why do you keep saying that? Because here's the thing, you're not the pastor, he is. Can I say one more thing? I'm going to move on here in just a second. It ain't the deacons that run the church. It ain't the trustees that run the church. And I, me and Brother Richards have not talked about anything. I don't know anything that's going on, and there may not be anything going on. But here's the thing. It ain't the deacons that run the church. It ain't the trustees that run the church. He said, Brother Matthew, I just don't agree with what he's doing. Talk to God about it. Don't talk to other people about it. Talk to God about it. And while you're at it, ask him whenever you get, whenever you're in your prayer closet, ask him to deal with you about your stinking pride. Let me move on. Y'all, y'all gonna drop my support after this one, all right? <laughs> it's in the Bible, I promise, all right? I'm not preaching my opinions. Because here's the thing, at the end of the day, you know how we've got to where we've gotten in our country? Men for generation after generation after generation have preached their opinions. They've not preached the Bible. I don't want to go hear a man preach his opinions. I want to hear a man tell me, thus saith the Lord. And I want him not just to say it, but I want him to back it up with Scripture. And if you're concentrating on your work for God, you know what? It won't, it'll bother you, but it won't distract you when someone else ain't doing what they ought to be doing for God. Because remember, you're the one working. You're the one that answers for your work. Whenever I was working a full-time job, you know what? They didn't call me, they didn't call me in the office and say, well, why ain't so-and-so doing the job? 
wasn't my job. Well, why ain't this done? It ain't my job. You gave me a clear job description. I fulfill that job description plus some. That's what I'm asked to do. You know what our job description as Christians is? Y'all ready? It's super simple. Y'all ready? Mark 16, 15, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's our job description. It's not to check up on what this one's doing. And I don't know why I'm hung up on that. But it's not to check up on what this one's doing and what that one's doing and what this one's doing and what this one. Well, they're, they're posting their services on Facebook and they've got this coming in and they've got that coming. Who cares? Change our work. Verse number 29, let me get back, back to the text. It is, I'm not even going to tell you all what time it is, all right? Verse number 29, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of the edifying, that may minister grace in the hearers, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed until the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, and be a kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. He talks about changing our words. He's talking about changing our whereabouts and our work. But then and lastly this morning, he talks about changing our ways. This deals with the encouragement in our lives. You know, he talks about grace in verse number 29. He said, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of the edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. The word, the word, great, or the word corrupt there, it literally means Bad, rotten, putrid. The word is used to describe decaying animal matter or vegetable matter. When's the last time that, you know, let me say this. You know, when we stop and think about corrupt communication, a lot of times we think, well, that's the cussing. Well, it does involve cussing, but it's, or cursing, however you all say it up here, Okay. It does involve that. But it's so much more than that. It's the attitude we have when we talk to somebody. It's the way that we respond when we're asked to do something. My pastor, Brother Chamberlain, we had a Save, we had a Save New England conference just a couple of weeks ago. And he asked me to do a couple of things. You know what? I didn't bat. I didn't talk that. I didn't. Yes, sir, I'll take care of it. So, Brother Matthew, you're a mission, and still a servant. I'm still a member at Granite State Baptist Church. And if I get asked to clean the toilets at Granite State, even if I'm not there, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to clean them. Why? Because it's part of that changing our ways. He says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. Let me move on. Not only change our ways, it deal, he talks about grace, but then he also talks about verse number 30 and 31. He says, grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. That word grieve is in the active voice, and it means to cause pain or sorrow. You know what he's literally saying? He said, can I say it this way? And please don't misunderstand. I'm not changing the King James. I think you all understand that. But can I paraphrase that for us? And hurt not the Holy Spirit of God. You know, whenever my kids do wrong and your kids do wrong, you know what? It hurts me. I don't even think, sometimes I don't even think they realize, you know what? You know why it hurts me? Because I feel like, okay, did I tell them not to do that? Did they know that was wrong? When Titus was a young one, whenever we first started trying to train him to do right, you know what? I began to ask. Whenever we'd go off to a bedroom by ourselves, you know what I'd ask him? Did you know that was wrong? Because sometimes he didn't know it was wrong. And at that point, it became an instructing moment. Hey, this is wrong, and this is why this is wrong. But if he knew it was wrong, then we started talking about, we did things the way the book of Proverbs talks about doing it. Here's the thing. Now when he does wrong, he knows it's wrong. And sometimes it'll make you stop and say, am I failing? No misunderstanding. I don't think the Holy Spirit does that, but you know what he said? 
and grieve not. To cause pain or sorrow. How many times in our Christian life because we refuse to put off this old man and put on the new man have we hurt the very heart of God? It's time to change clothes. He not only talks about grace, he talks about grief not, but then in verse number 32 he tells us to be gentle and be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. You know, that's a lost art nowadays. Nowadays everybody thinks, well, I've got an opinion and I ought to be able to tell it. Or they talk to me that way, I'm going to talk to them that way. Do you want them to see Christ in you? Do I want them to see Christ in me? And be kind one to another. You know, up here, not so much, but down south, we still open doors for people. We still, hey, how you doing? Now, I've done that up here, Brother Rob, and what do you want? Okay, I won't do that no more. But here's the thing. Be kind. You know what it costs you to smile at a stranger? Absolutely nothing. You know what it costs you to be nice to a stranger? Absolutely nothing. You know what it costs to let that person that's obviously trying to edge their way over and get in front of you? You know what it costs you to let them over? Absolutely nothing. Now, y'all forgive me because my flesh says, they ain't getting in front of me. And y'all's does too. <laughs> Your time ain't no more important than what mine is, and you knew that you knew that lane merge was coming five minutes ago. Cost you absolutely nothing to be kind. I got a little acronym here I want to give you before you speak. It's the letter. It's the word think. Before you speak, the letter T. Is it true? it's not true according to scripture we shouldn't be saying it anyway number two is it true not only is it true is it helpful does it help the situation or does it hurt the situation so brother Matthew you know you gotta hurt people to help them sometimes I understand that but are you the, really the one that ought to be hurting them not only is it, hurt, is it helpful number two or number three excuse me the letter I is it inspiring does it inspire them? Does it motivate them to go on for God? The letter N, is it necessary? Do you absolutely have to say that? You know, there's a thing called a filter. Y'all know that, right? It's called a filter, and everybody, everybody needs a filter. Everybody needs a filter. Because a lot of times what happens is the things that we think that come out through here and it wasn't necessary for us to say that. Nor is it necessary the letter K there is it kind. When you talk to somebody can I encourage you to think? When I talk to somebody I need to think. Is it true? Is it helpful? Is it inspiring? Is it necessary? Is it kind? Here's the thing. A lot of times when I've actually taken a moment and said, okay, is it true? Yeah, it's true. Is it helpful? Yeah. Is it inspiring? Is it necessary? Usually that one out there usually gets me. Because here's the thing, just because it comes here, don't mean it ought to come out here. It's time to change clothes this morning. Can I ask you a question, church? I love y'all, I really do. I'm, I mean that from the depths of my heart. I've tried to pray for y'all every day. But at the end of the day, are you still walking around with the old rags on? Whenever people see you around town here in Augusta, do they see a new man? Do they see those new clothes? Or do they see you walking around with those old clothes on? You know, whenever people get new clothes, you can always tell it when they come to church. Because it's like they walk in strutting. 
Y'all ever seen a turkey walk around or that big old tom? He's got them tail feathers, and man, he's got them all bowed out and everything. That's the way people, whenever they get new clothes, that's how they walk in sometimes. I mean, they got their chest stuck out, proud of it and everything. But you know what? We ought to put on the new man. And not be proud of it. But you know what? Eventually, you know what people begin to notice? They begin to notice that new man. And that new man will be a testimony, not just for the church, but he'll be a testimony of the grace of God. And how that he can change any life and he can change their life. I'm closing this morning. Can I last question? I'm done. Have you changed clothes? Are you, or are you still walking around with the old man when you ought to be walking around in the new man? Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for your many blessings. Thank you for the privilege and opportunity you give me to stand and to preach your word this morning. Lord, I pray that these words that's been said has been a help and a blessing. Lord, I pray that you'd take it. Use it for your honor and your glory. Lord, bless as a preacher comes. Lord, to close this service however he sees fit. And we'll thank you and we'll praise you in Jesus' name. Amen, amen.